Welcome Wargamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough, and today we are going to be talking all about some Ideneth Deepkin. This is a battle tome that came out during a very busy portion of my life recently, and so I kind of had to skim over it, but I am getting back into it, and there are some fantastic stories within this book. We're going to be reading and talking about two of them in particular within the timeline section, but they actually give us a fantastic look at what the Ideneth Deepkin are up to now in the Era of the Beast. Whenever Games Workshop moves the plot forward to another chapter, it takes some time for every single army to kind of get some lore regarding how those changes affected them. I mean, these are setting-wide things like the Necroquake or the Rumgate Wars, that kind of stuff, where every faction is concerned in some fashion. It's just not all of those effects are very immediate within the lore. They don't have time to go army by army and explain exactly what happened. But here we have one for the Deepkin. So we're going to be talking uh, about two stories, The Ocean's Bloom and Era of the Beast, because to me, even though they're two stories, they're really tightly locked together with what we know about the lore in the story. But before we get into that, I do want to give a shout out to Not Just Gaming, an awesome store on the East Coast here in the United States. If you are listening and looking to get and save some money on Games Workshop products, they offer 30% off everything shipped. And using the affiliate link in my description below does go a long way to supporting me and my family at no additional cost to you. I get a piece and you save some money. Thank you to everyone who has used that link before. And so we're going to start today by reading through the story, The Ocean's Bloom. A great wave of life magic created by Alariel the Everqueen penetrates not only the lands of the realms, but also the furthest reaches of their oceans. Kelp forests grow to enormous size, stretching their slimy fronds out to grasp and smash those vessels that stray too close. Coastal shallows are engulfed by billowing clouds of fauna in the throes of a reproductive frenzy, which in turn draws swarms of predators and leviathans of the deep seeking to gorge themselves on the exploding numbers of prey. The beastmasters of the Ideneth are stunned to see the size and ferocity of their latest acquisitions. Even the Corelliums, the coral reefs in which the souls of deceased Ideneth are interred to ensure there is no chance of them being reclaimed by Slanesh seem to sparkle with vibrant energies. The Sithai souls received from Marathi are carefully stored within these living structures, and there's even hope that one day they may be resurrected. Meanwhile, as the realm's oceans thrive, so too do the enclaves, redoubling the frequency of their raids and establishing new outposts far and wide. So we've talked about the right of life here quite a bit on the channel, and this is uh, in the first section of Broken Realms Kragnos, that narrative book. Uh, the, she did a ritual that basically reversed the Necroquake in terms of saturating the realms with death magic, and now it's being saturated with life magic. Things are still in weird flux, though. There are still endless spells, all of that stuff. But it was a boom to the realms to see life kind of explode. Now, ultimately, the aftershocks of this is that Kragnos was released from his prison, that's kind of an afterthought, because everywhere else, the realms are doing really well. They're very vibrant. Essentially, it's like a B12 shot into the natural cycles of things. Creatures get bigger, meaner, stronger, and tougher, but also just produce more abundantly. Like they, in this story, there's a bunch of smaller, like lower food chain animals all of a sudden have a population boom. Well, now the predators do too. They have more resources, more food, more calories to eat. They go out there, they get bigger. The Deepkin themselves, who use animals extensively within their way of life, are seeing the benefits of this immediately, which is just fantastic. I, it just makes perfect sense that they would. It also gives a shout out to their sort of like, I can't remember what they call it in 40k, but the craft world Eldar can like basically use like a spirit song and, and craft chitin in Wraithbone, I think is what it's called, uh, into like specific shapes. The Ideneth can do the exact same thing with what is essentially coral, and they use this coral to store souls. There's a shout out to some possible units getting released in the future, but very vague on details. And it's just business is booming. And that just has to do with how tied they are to their natural environment, right? They use it for shielding, but also for all of their production, their beasts of burden, their food, everything. So the question of how are the Ideneth doing overall in the Era of the Beast? The answer is thumbs up. They're digging it. It's not without its dangers, but it has benefited them very clearly. Now let's go to our next story here, the one right above it. And this is all from the uh, Ideneth Deepkin Battle Tome. The next story is Era of the Beast. The coming of Kragnos heralds a great surge in greenskin attacks. Even the Ideneth suffer greatly as bands of cruel boys lie in wait along shorelines, ambushing the Enclave's raiding parties as they emerge from the oceans. After three princes of Nautilar, 
and their phalanxes are butchered in the Battle of Blister Marsh, the Enclave declares a Kunaroi, a campaign of vengeance across the sadistic cruel boys that will only end when tens of thousands of the creatures are culled for every one of the slain princes. And that's it. That's the story. It's just, hey, the cruel boys are just giving them a hard time. So, yes, their business is booming, of course, because other monsters and their resources are, are thriving. But at the same time, the realms have become more and more dangerous, in this case, because of the cruel boys. Now, it's kind of interesting. I have some back and forth in my brain about, like, why would the Enclaves really struggle against the cruel boys? Why couldn't you just come out of the ocean somewhere else kind of a deal? But the truth is, if they rely on that kind of secrecy... They may just become overconfident on it, right? No one no one follows us. No one tails us back to our base. But the fact that you keep going back to a central location is going to broadcast to somebody, hey, you could set a trap here. And these must have been sizable armies because, I mean, you have to have not only, like, an army to address what is essentially a Eidneth Deepkin raiding party, which is an army unto itself. You have to keep it discreet enough to not be immediately sound, right? So the trap is set. And then enough strength to not only push them back, but strike down three princes, which is actually a massive achievement because there's not a ton of those. These are elite fighters beyond elite fighters. So it's just kind of this interesting, like, man, how big of a force did the Cruel Boys have and how are they able to hide it to snap the trap? And then how many times is this story happening across the setting where the Cruel Boys are like just actively trapping and hunting anything around them? It just makes them seem all-encompassing and just kind of everywhere. I mean, you know, it's kind of a thing where, like, every book has to have a Cruel Boy story now that Cruel Boys are the newest model line. Like, I get it. At the same time, for coming out of nowhere, they have become quite a global threat. Now, of course, either neither of these stories have a wealth of information to teach us. The first one basically says, Deepkin are doing overall really good in the era of the Beast because that's when the Rite of Life happened. And the second story is just, it's just not without its dangers as well because as... Resources are more plenty, so are now Predators, and Predators includes any other army who would see the Deepkin destroyed. And so let's take a step back from the specifics of the stories and just kind of talk about the Deepkin as a whole, like how they're faring. We never really got a ton of resolution from the events of Broken Realms, meaning we saw the Aedith Deepkin really ally strongly with the Daughters of Cain until Marathi got her ascension, and then she basically, well... They were against her up until then, but then she ascended and made the deal with Volturnus, and now they kind of allied a little bit after that. But that's not a firm set in stone, like, there's no bonds of trust between the Daughters of Cain and the Deepkin, like, in, in no way, shape, or form. They have an understanding, a mutual respect, because they come, have, have a common ancestry, really. But at the end of the day, they are not, like, buddies. The same could be said for the Deepkin's relationship to really, honestly, any factions from order they're always contentious at best they always have their own priorities first this did nothing to change any of that there are some stories in this book about them assisting dawnbringer crusades but they don't really staple themselves to them they're not going to venture out of the ether sea they, they maybe help you get around particular areas or navigate certain things maybe even like teleport or transport through some of their you know their underways or whatever they have but they're not going out and like establishing long-term bases outside of just having like an embassy or something. So I guess what I'm getting at with that is while the threat level on land has certainly magnified, that threat level is sort of removed from them because it's a lot of like interfaction drama that's brought out by new enemies, the Cruel Boys, and strained relationships between Daughters of Cain and the Cities of Sigmar, who they absolutely have to butt shoulders all the time. They don't get to run away like the Deepkin do when they've, you know, hosed over all of their allies. So they are somewhat removed from, I guess, sort of the, the interfactional drama a little bit, or at least they have always have this back door of just kind of receding from the conversation until things cool off, whereas other armies really don't. I guess Carriage and Overlords is another one. They just go up to the sky and they're like, whatever, we don't care. And I think that makes them a very interesting order faction. They are, I think, more alone and solo than most other factions within Grand Alliance Order in terms of how they can and will interact with others. Maybe the Seraphon as an example, because they're even there's more of like a language barrier there too. But as far as like, you know, people who can communicate, they are very much the loner faction. What I'd love to see in future, like the, as far as the direction of the narrative, is ways to bring them in more. Maybe just more coastal cities of Sigmar that involve the Deepkin quite a bit, I think would be really cool. Like, I know it's kind of their shtick to be the loner kid who, you know, now they're benefiting from all the things that are happening in the major setting. All the life is just magnified tenfold. 
but it's the drama of seeing them have to work with other people that really it thrills me and so seeing them have more problems with cruel boys makes me think like oh is there going to be a time where they work alongside the cities of sigmar because they have a mutual threat or they're trying to like take notes on how best to fight these guys like i would love to see that push them out of their comfort zone of just hiding in the water to have to interact because that's a great story in and of its own but anyway, friends, that is just my thoughts. I wanted to keep everyone updated on what's going on with the Eidnith Deepkin. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you are a Deepkin player, what do you think, right? For your personal enclave, how do you think things are panning out? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.